Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Digital Economy Panel. I'm Kendra Jo Grindle. I'm a Senior Community Development Officer at the ION Institute, where I'm the strategic lead for our broadband and sea level rise work. Today, I'm joined by um, five incredible panelists who I'll introduce in a brief moment, but just to set the stage a little bit about the digital economy, um, I wanted to share kind of how we define it and look at it and how we'll be talking about it today. So the digital economy encompasses a vast range of career paths from installing and maintaining broadband infrastructure across the state and the unlimited range of internet-based work that people do on their computers more in the probably the last couple of years than we have seen in quite some time. Um, to the sci computer science and technology development uh, work that is ongoing and ever expanding in our state. So um, again, our panelists, I'll quickly introduce so that we can hop right into questions. Um, I have a list of questions that we'll be asking until about 1055 to get the conversation going and spur some thinking. And then we, throughout that time though, please put your own questions as an attendee in the chat. We'll be pulling those and then at around 10.55, we'll transition into attendee questions and then we'll wrap up um, after about 15 to 20 minutes. Right. So today I'm joined by Frank Appen, who's a professor of uh, cybersecurity and project management at Thomas College. Karim Durdag, president and chief operating officer at Great Works Internet, GWI for most of you. Charlie Collins, the deputy executive director of workforce training for the Maine Community College System. Chloe Dyer, Director for Shabig Island Library and a current graduate, graduate student in computer science at Northeastern University, the Rue Institute, and Jason Judd, Executive Director for Educate Maine. So we're gonna hop right into, um, you should be able to see everyone, hopefully you can hear me well. Um, so we'll hop right into questions. Um, the first is going to be for Chloe and Karam. I'm wondering what you think um, about the digital economy and what excites you most about it right now. So if we can hear from Karen first and then we'll go to Chloe. Well, I do think that the digital economy is the 21st century way of living. Uh, and to some, to some large extent, it's a tectonic shift in the way human beings interact with one another, where the digital economy is not based on some transactional event that occurs like it did in the 19th and 20th century, but it's based on human relationships. And the human relationships tend to be fleeting. They tend to be uh, capricious, but sometimes uh, they can be very long, everlasting and joyful. And I think as the 21st century evolves, I think those things will evolve. In terms of, in and of itself, it is the underpinning of civilization. Uh, and it is here to stay. For Maine, the way it plays a role in that digital economy, I think, is an existential question that it will answer over the many, many years. And it's an important one as the demographics change, as the way we produce GDP changes, as the way we attract uh, and inspire our kids coming in from the high schools to the trade schools to the Votech schools to the colleges changes. As it becomes more inclusive and diverse, the way Maine answers those questions will evolve, hopefully. If it doesn't, um, we will lose the relevance that we have had uh, within the broader economy, within the US economy. So I think it's an important, important, it's an important perspective. And I think the, obviously from my perspective, building resilient, reliable, robust, secure, and uh, sustainable infrastructure is the only way to ensure that that digital economy can be leveraged. So that's why we build fiber optic networks for everybody across the state of Maine and making it affordable. Because if it's not those things, then one cannot participate. And one, if you cannot participate, you can't have society. You can't have democracy. You can't have telehealth. You can't have remote working. Uh, you can't have distance education. You can't have commerce. So, so it's a very, very fundamentally important question. Very. Thank you, Karam. That warms my broadband heart this morning. Um, Chloe, what about you? What excites you about the digital economy right now? Um, well, I think it really just has completely changed the way we communicate, obviously. Um, I come from a communications background, so that's something that really intrigues me. But um, so I'm also a student at the Rue Institute in Portland, which is a relatively new campus that Northeastern brought to Maine. Um, and one of their goals really is to 
bring tech to Maine. Um, I think we can all agree that Maine has been lagging behind um, in the digital space um, as it relates to the digital economy. You know, there's still a lot of areas of the state that don't have even basic internet, you know, high speed access. Um, so that's one thing that we actually face on Shebig. I'm the library director there. Um, we have pretty decent internet, but, um, you know, it, there's still a lot of people that use our library for for that. And I think that you don't see that everywhere. And that's something that um, I would, I'm excited about to see if, you know, if this expansion of the digital economy can help Maine in that sense, um, you know, just more access to um, technology in general across the state. Um, and I, I'm optimistic for that, but I hope we can, we can see that in the coming years here. Thank you. And just this week, there have been two wonderful broadband conversations happening on Shabik virtually, which has been wonderful to see. So on the, the other side of this, this question is going to be for Jason and Frank. What concerns you the most about the digital economy? So if we could hear from Jason first, and then we'll go to Frank. Thanks, Kendra. I think what concerns me the most is, you know, obviously we're doing tremendous work in this area and, and, and investing in tremendous ways with state and federal resources for, for broadband and, and other needed infrastructure, but we're still not investing enough and we're still not investing fast enough to get to where we need to be to be competitive with other uh, states across the country. So really good work happening, but I worry, um, I worry that we we need to keep up that investment and 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 keep making sure everyone's as connected as possible. We also need to go beyond simply connecting communities uh, with broadband and high speed internet so that folks can participate. We also need to think about uh, you know the number of folks that. Uh, uh, are not able to participate for a few years down the road. Like, how do we how do we connect them? Uh, how do we get them to learn computer science in the K twelve environment? How do we bring communities, uh, you know, together for co working spaces so that we can have internet in one, uh, you know, particular area? Sort of in, in in the meantime, that folks can can you know, as as um, Chloe mentioned, sort of folks coming to the library. You know, how can we have more of that specifically? So for me, what concerns me is that we've got to help communities and schools and businesses you know, get ready for these changes and get ready for some of the culture changes and sort of the future of work that the digital economy is um, leading, leading the way specifically so that our young people, our adults can be competitive in this kind of worldwide uh, marketplace specifically. So thankfully we've got some really good people, really good organizations working on this, both on the broadband infrastructure front, but also on sort of the curriculum and instruction and teacher support front. But I think we need to keep setting aspirational goals, putting the resources behind them and, uh, and, and making sure Maine can be very competitive in this space nationally. Uh, and then I think we'll have significant both educational benefits as well as economic benefits specifically. Wonderful, thanks. And Frank? So I see we have a diversity problem. Uh, when I look at classrooms at, at colleges and universities, uh, we have way too many men because somehow we're not attracting the full capability of what we can do in Maine. And I know that we do a lot, but I'm not seeing us being effective in terms of getting that reasonable split. And I mentioned gender, but it's every other demographic and it's not something new. I remember when I was teaching in Florida, we found out that our least served demographic was Hispanic men. And it's regional, it's local, where we've got to think about how can we make it acceptable to get into those STEM fields from the pupils at junior school, middle school, high school, and then take them through the whole economy uh, in this area. We're in trouble as a nation because we don't have enough depth and breadth available to us. And that means that they get overpaid, which means they're too expensive and, and we're hurting ourselves. And, and we can get depressed by that, but we can also work on that as part of everybody's inclusive. 
but also to work with the hearts and minds to realize that that's a really good opportunity. And where we've had diversity, we've had a lot of success. So the opportunity is there, but somewhere our communication isn't good enough yet, it is improving. But I'd like to see us going a lot further with that. Um, if I look at rural access, it's a challenge, but it's a technology challenge. It costs more than a thousand times the cost of a central New York high-speed internet node than out in a very distant area. And, and there are technologies that are bubbling uh, in terms of low Earth orbit and all sorts of things that are happening. So it's not gloom and doom and cost. There are ways that we can improve what we are doing. We can move some funds around. And all of these things will come together with short, medium, and long-term things. But we've got to work on them. Another area, and that's partially because of my specialization, is a recognition that technology creates a lot of value. We have people, organizations, and governance that enable improved processes. These improved processes are people and leadership and governance to do the right thing for our customers, our suppliers, and all the rest of it. And technology is an amplifier so that we can deliver that without pushing the price up. In other words, we can now deliver more and have full employment. Let's not fall off, I hate machines, they take my job. No, no, we can lift everything. This isn't competitive if we work with the machine. So if I now start looking how that works, as we use technology to create more value, we need to remember there's a downside. If I never drive a motor vehicle, I will not die in a motor vehicle accident. If I never use a computer, I will never get hacked. So if I do use a computer, there is a chance that something can go wrong, just like a motor vehicle. And as we create more value with technology, we also need to realize that we expose ourselves to different risks and we need to invest not only in using this technology, but also reduce those risks that are combined with that. And that is a business leadership communication channel that we need to do. So if I really simplify everything that I put there, it's about communication, that we can use the positives from all possible sources and make a change. And it can be make a big change, because the pandemic had a hugely positive effect on me. We realized that we can be remote and do work around the nation and all of those things. Now, I realize the pandemic is bad, but let's not forget to harvest the good that we can, all right? And, and find the positives that we don't just have the negatives. So I, I introduced some negatives, but also try to link and join some dots to how we can use this and that we have a bright future, despite these gloomy things that I had to talk about. Well, oh, that's wonderful. And I, I appreciate you bringing those negatives, but looking forward and looking towards solutions. And so, you know, I, and I appreciate everyone's diversity of answers on this so far. And we're hearing from, you know, Karams in the industry and, and we have educators. And so I'm wondering for you, Charlie, you know, what connections or collaborations could there be more of between educators and industry leaders to ensure that students and just the general population are coming out more connected and informed? Sure. Um, thank you all. And, and thank you for that question, Kendra. I, uh, with the work we're doing in the community colleges, it is really focused with starting with employers oftentimes and understanding. Uh, we have traditional community college associate degrees and certificates that we've been doing for years, but we've really put much more effort and thought into what are shorter term stackable credentials um, that help um, uh, people here in Maine take smaller um, chunks of their education, sort of get the skill sets and the understanding at, at times that they need them and then stack towards perhaps a credential 
uh, with that. So one of the things that we, we've really been working on, and we, we, you may have heard this, we, we've been addressing things with apprenticeships with uh, organizations where we've really said there's an earn and learn model. You can come to get your education or you can go directly to a company that has an apprenticeship but but when you do when you do that you may find yourself doing instructional part of that apprenticeship through a local community college so we have a number of examples of where students can go directly into whether it's a, a career changing adult or it's a student uh, graduate out of high school they can find a pathway where a company will hire them and they're working but they are working on a credential they are working on, on areas and we can find a lot of those um, in, in manufacturing uh, opportunities, but more so we're seeing those in healthcare and our larger uh, healthcare systems are really looking for that opportunity where a person can come in to a medical facility, start working say as a CNA or a medical assisting and then find additional pathways um, for um, increased skills and then ultimately different jobs within that, that pathway uh, with them. And what we think is really successful is when employers meet at that point of saying, we wanna come halfway, let's provide an opportunity for them to earn and learn. And that's happening, as I said, with Maine Health, with Northern Light and a number of others also with large manufacturers right now, you may have been familiar with the training we're doing for BIW, Pratt & Whitney and others. Those are all earn and learn models where students are getting either quickly trained or their training is extending over the course of a year, but they're keeping a full-time job while they do it. Yeah, thank you. And, and I appreciate you mentioning that it's, you know, it's, it's K-12 through post, you know, post at, um, secondary schooling um, age children as well, but also retraining adults in, in this field and through multiple fields. A absolutely, we, we've seen the churn right now, Kendra Joe. you know, there is resignation, there is a lot of churn right now. And that is this gap between, we've got the jobs, but where are the people? People are think rethinking things right now. And we need to sort of be on the ready to deliver well, if the actual opportunities exist, you know, I've been with Jason recently and Karen and I were on phone calls earlier this summer, really trying to understand wh where this next step is going. And a lot of it does come with folks saying, questioning maybe that four-year degree, questioning the two-year degree, the time commitment, what can it do? And I think it, it's the responsibility of our educational institutions to recognize that and say, can we give you something smaller? Can we give you a workforce training, micro-credential, shorter term skill um, to get you started, but doesn't prevent you from entering the workforce? We, you can do both. Absolutely. Karim, on the industry side of things, I mean, have you, has your, um, has your company and team had to shift your thinking about hiring process and and in implementing some of these tools or looking to do so as you train workforce and bring on new workforce? Well, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the entire industry, one could argue society is in the middle of a tectonic shift akin to the rural education program or akin to the rural of the national highway system in the 50s, right? So you have an entire society that wants to do a quantum shift in the way they want to work they, the way they relate to work and the way that infrastructure is supposed to help them get to that point, right? So you essentially are in the middle of a once in a generational upshift of essential infrastructure that's been asked to, asked to essentially support aspirations and needs and ambitions. So from our point, if you just look at from the, our own workforce, our own employee, employee base, so we're very comfortable with the remote working. We always have been. And to Frank's point, I think the pandemic sort of, you know, nailed the verification point on that. Great. So, but they also raise the question of how do we relate to each other, right? So if we are an employee base and we're a B Corp, so, you know, we have obligations, responsibilities, and things that we do on behalf of our employees, the environment, the communities, how do we, how do we correlate, collate, and manage all of that remotely? So that, that's one question. The second question is in terms of having newer employees come and join 
join the company. The game is different. The equation of employer-employee relationship has been inverted. The power is with the employee. It is no longer the 19th, 20th century laissez-faire. We tell the employees what to do and on we go. No, it's not that, which is a good thing that it's changed. So now the employer is asking, what is my work balance uh, relationship? Uh, what can I do in terms of flexibility? Uh, for us as a company, which is in the tech and the construction, what are the things that we can do to make sure that BIPOC immigrant and women that have not traditionally been in the telecommunications sector or the construction sector, how do we make sure that the invitation is there in terms of making sure the environment is right for them to be included and then for them to contribute in terms of leverage and scale, right? So those are really, really important societal questions that we're facing because as Charlie said, you know, there is a massive need by the industry in terms of workforce, but that workforce is evaluating the basic assumptions and the questions of what it means to work, how to work, and what's the purpose of work. It's not just enough to go in there and just say, I'm going to come in at eight and punch out at five. Those days, thankfully, are gone. So you have to create that sense of meaning. You have to create that sense of belonging, right? And much more so if you're remote, do we have collaborative workspaces at our headquarters? Uh, do we do meet and greets at some other point? What are the ways to have those human relationships, right? And at the same time, at the same time, because as an infrastructure provider, we work with communities. So when we work with communities, we are asked the question, so what will this infrastructure do for me? And we say, what this allows you to do is it allows you to attract young families to your environment. It allows you to attract younger and forwardly mobile uh, individuals that may have been feeling marginalized prior because now they can actually do things from here for companies that are on the West Coast or vice versa. So it opens up the worldview by orders of magnitude, which also then means, okay, what does it then mean to be a participant within economic development, right? So prior, if economic development was just this hypothetical policy making thing that only people did in glass towers, those days are again gone. Because now your community is saying, well, economic development for me means X, Y, and Z. Because I can actually do certain things that prior I couldn't with good infrastructure. So it's a, it's a, it's a green field of how human beings are going to relate to each other and to work from, my, from our perspective at GWI. Thank you. And that's refreshing to hear that it is, and the employers are adapting to that very large shift that we've seen um, across multiple, all industries, really in all sectors, not just in our state, but across the country. Mm -hmm. So just real quickly, again, if you're joining us for the digital economy panel, thank you. Um, please feel free to drop questions as you listen and, and are intrigued into the chat. We're going to pull those and ask some of them towards the end of this. Um, and again, I'm, I'm uh, here today with Karen, Charlie, Frank, um, Chloe, and Jason. And so, Chloe, I have a quick question for you. Um, you know, you're in the workforce as um, the director of the library on Shebaik. You're also a student right now. So I'm just wondering how digital skills have equipped you for both your work and going back into school. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, so I've actually started both of these roles um, at the library and at, during at the school during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I think that that was a little bit of a shift where in the past, um, you know, those, those might not have been offered remotely or like in a hybrid sense, um, which is how I'm actually navigating both right now. Um, I'm mostly going into the library, but here and there I can work remotely um, and same with the school. So they kind of have an interesting approach now where um, you can either go in person or do remote at any time without indicating, you know, which one you're gonna do. Um, so I think it, it has provided a lot of flexibility with other students that I'm studying with. Um, some of them are not even located in the Portland area right now. Um, so I think that they, the school Northeastern kind of shifted their vision um, from what I saw from the initial, um, you know, starting the new campus in Portland where it was really a tech hub just for the area. Um, 
but I have, I've met some fellow students. One of them is in AmeriCorps up in Presque Isle, Maine. Um, so I think that examples like that, I've found very interesting um, that these people elsewhere are now studying at the Rowe Institute. Um, and I think the goal is that they'll eventually be down in the Portland area in person, but overall the pandemic has really shifted you know, how that looks um, for different students, um, as well as for the library. You know, we just opened again for the public um, in after Memorial Day. So it really hasn't been very long that we're back um, in person for that. And so over the pandemic, you know, the library had to really shift to a more digital sense um, that we weren't really offering. Um, you know, whether it was Zoom events or um, presentations or, um, you know, um, offering things for people to get online, materials, um, upping our digital presence in general. So, um, you know, I think we're, we're doing better with that now, but um, that's definitely what I've noticed from both of those sectors as being a, a, a student right now and working. Thank you. Yeah, it's incredible to see that people have been able to, or hear that people have been able to stay kind of where they are instead of shifting to Portland. Um, but maybe there's still the hope that they can get there at some point. So on um, from Frank, um, as a professor and being in con you know computer science majors, cybersecurity, et cetera, how have you had to shift your recruitment message or what is that recruitment message when you're talking to students in Maine or students elsewhere. I am muted, but I sounded really great, I promise. Um, so for Frank, um, I'm just wondering for you, how have you had to shift or adapt your recruitment message for prospective computer science majors that are looking at Thomas College or looking at um, some of the areas that you teach? If you look at recruitment is to recognize that everything is fluid, whether that be coming into a field or where you go after the field. Uh, joining up with what others said, uh, we've got a graduate student working for someone in Texas doing work in DC, but lives north of Bangor using Karam's infrastructure. All right, so those ideas of movement, um, we recruit people, uh, let's take one example, uh, a, a special ed teacher that wanted to change their career, had some time, did a cyber master's degree, coming in from a totally different field, was employed by a global consulting company before they graduated, uh, obviously had more than 100% uh, income increase, and things like that are possible should you wish to do that. So linking with Charles, the idea of painting a picture of what you can be, that you can be working full time. And we can do that at these levels, those levels and those other levels as people shift around. And that is in fact, which we, we know where we're going. So when you recruit, I say, okay, if these technologies need to work for people, I need folks that know about big data. I know that are psychologists, that are human behaviorists, that are uh, organization development specialists. So when you start looking at computer science as where it's going, where cybersecurity is going, it's an integrated field that covers all of business and most sciences and arts, and it all comes into one package. Now, I don't know all of those, but I have my unique selection of opportunities and I can move and shift and fill a few holes and move my skills. And that might say, well, if you've got those skills, you could give them anywhere and you might not be in Maine. Well, I'm still in Maine. I don't need to leave to get that. And, and guess what? It works the other way. If I have a specialist in New, New York that needs to work for the state of Maine, are they gonna take a salary drop to come here? I don't think so. So they might cost more. So if we could get that person to work here in a virtual form. So the fluidity that is available means that we've got to take off the blinkers and not say, I've got to recruit within 40 miles of the physical campus. All right. And 
that a person can attend in person, but every online class I have, I offer no less than one and a half hours on WebEx or Zoom, so they can be live and interact and present, and sometimes they're on the move when someone else is driving the car doing their presentation. That's not new. I did that before 2012. We can deliver these benefits by harvesting what we have, and that means whether it's schooling or high, uh, higher ed, it's all over. And that, that works two ways. I could have someone in San Diego coming to take students out of Maine, but maybe there's some folks in San Diego that want our specific slice as we stack skills because we can be these nomads of skills, capabilities, knowledge, and wisdom as they interact with others. So I believe it's going to be a many to many across all ranges. And we see the evidence today, and we saw it a while ago. I got my PhD in 2007, stayed in Maine because my son was at high school, but they didn't offer that degree. So I took it in Minnesota. I never went to Minnesota, all right? So we can do that at all levels. Yes, we can. And that's where I come back to the, pan the pandemic as actually having a little bit of a positive side effect that we can exploit for the benefit of all. Yeah, I, one of our partners on the broadband side of things, Susan Corbett, I likes to call it a collateral benefit. Um, if there could be any from the pandemic, it's these little collateral benefits that we have to capitalize on. Yeah. So Jason, you know, I, on the broad, so again, in broadband conversations, we've talked about, and even in the audience today, there's such a diversity of, of individuals within the workforce and the digital economy is across so many sectors. How are educators across Maine, I mean, from the perspective of Educate Maine, how can educators adapt or have been adapting the conversation with students to say, you know, you can be a member of the digital economy, even if you're in the fishing sector or the forestry sector, or you wanna go into a tech field or you wanna go into community development. Have there been conversational shifts or um, do you think that those will be upcoming more? We certainly are seeing uh, the shifts in, in K through 12 classrooms uh, across Maine and we have for several years. I mean, even just having this event and this conversation, I think for your audience is really helpful for them to help you know, understand what the digital economy is and how they can help prepare their students for success in the digital economy. I think we, we have some more work to do when it comes to really communicating pathways within the digital economy, within the K-12 space, because uh, not everybody across 16 counties is participating sort of directly in terms of their job in, in pieces of the digital economy. Uh, so we have to sort of change the local narrative a bit uh, to help young people understand that there are these pathways that you can access regardless of where you live in the state. Uh, even if you don't have a neighbor that's a software developer or working on broadband or sort of other related careers. So I think we have some more work to do as a state to kind of rise up this conversation and have it in a lot of different uh, events and sort of community conversations so that young people can see I can stay in my community and be successful in a role in the digital economy and get high wages and great benefits and work for a great employer. We are seeing many teachers across the state go through professional development uh, specifically to think about how they can make sure their curriculum and instruction and assessment does align uh, with the skills needed for the digital economy. So we have English teachers that are learning how to teach computer science. We have art teachers that are bringing computer science concepts into their art classrooms, you know? So, so that's really great to see. And we also are seeing a lot more interdisciplinary work at all levels throughout the K-12 system where you're working on sort of, you know, a community problem, if you will, but approaching it from a number of different disciplines, which is how things often happen sort of in the digital economy and in the workplace that that's being brought into the into the K-12 space specifically. What I worry about is too many of the courses 
uh, to help students prepare for the digital economy are still sort of opt-in courses. So students have to choose to take them in the K-12 environment at sometimes, especially in the, in, the, in the high school space. And that's where we see a lot of inequity based on race, based on gender, based on income. Uh, and uh, that worries me. So we really need to keep talking about how every student can have foundational experiences in K through 12 classrooms that prepare them for the digital economy and not have to opt into pathways uh, in order to become you know, a, a software developer or work in IT or other. We've got to give everybody a baseline because we know that, you know, for example, in high schools, if a student takes a computer science course, they're six times more likely to actually major in computer science in college. If girls take one computer science class in high school, they're actually 10 times more likely to pursue uh, computer science in the higher ed space. So to me, it's, we also need to keep working on that access and making sure we're not just creating sort of opt-in programs that do not speak to sort of the participation that we want in the economy. We want everyone to participate in the digital economy, regardless of where you grow up, regardless of what your parents do for work specifically. So really great work happening, but I think we need to keep thinking about how do we make sure every kid at that school uh, has, has a foundational set of, of skills to be able to follow a, a pathway in, in this space. But thankfully our educators are doing miraculous work and the pandemic has, has really helped um, them access and understand you know, how important the digital economy is. And uh, we've seen some great champions all across the state uh, doing good work in this area and good partnerships between the K-12 system and the higher ed system, as well as employers. So exciting to see the movement. We just got to keep it up and, and remove some of the barriers to participation so that all students can access this you know, great work. Yeah, absolutely. And I, the one thing that I can say is buy your local educator a cookie because I think they have just done incredible work and had to adapt so quickly at all education levels during this during the last couple of years. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So yeah, buy them a cookie, give them a hug after this pandemic's over. <laughs> so Karen, throughout so many of the responses, we've heard this equity thread, race, gender. Um, I'm just wondering from your perspective, I mean, in Maine, I wouldn't have heard those conversations. I don't know that I would would have heard this thread even a year and a half ago or two years ago um, in, in our work. And now it's coming up more and more. I mean, on the broadband, in broadband conversations, it, it was always this rural needed it, urban didn't. And now I think that it's shifting a little bit. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that. I mean, you GWI works all across the state um, and particularly in the Biddeford Southern Maine area. So what is kind of how does the connectivity issues that we're seeing also connect to the social justice issues that are, you know, everyone's really starting to take notice of? They've always been there, but we're starting to have more of those conversations. Yeah, so it's a it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and GWI's heart, right? The the whole idea of how do you use infrastructure to stitch society in a way that's sustainable for the next 40, 50, 60, 100 years. Telecommunications as a traditional industry has done a massively miserable job of taking equity and inclusion into its considerations in the past 60 to 70 years. It's rife with redlining practices. It's rife with exclusionary practices. It's rife with cherry picking. Those days are over. Those days are over because you have 2,000 ISPs across the country that have decided that six will not be the incumbent monopolies across the entire country for all the good reasons that the communities are saying that it's time. So the idea of choice is key here. And when you deploy choice, and if you do it intentionally, uh, then you allow for, the, allow for the inclusion of conversations of racial equity and, and inclusion and diversity. So in our, in our case, we believe extremely strongly to our core that if you have infrastructure that's delivered universally, you normalize the playing field a little bit, right? So if you're going into neighborhoods, communities, cities, municipalities, county, countywide, and you're going everywhere, you're not now cherry picking. So that's, that, that's one. 
Uh, second, you have communities that have been marginalized prior to such a great degree, you need to win their trust. You need to be able to say that I am a servant leader and I am committed to making sure that you are part and parcel of the conversation. Now, when you have that invitation to that kind of a clearing field, now you, now you get people to participate and say, what are their needs, right? It's a, it's a question that leads to other questions. And if you invite yourself to be vulnerable and you say, I am here to listen and I'm here to understand, then those communities open up to you. And they say, here's what really matters to us, right? It's also a way to lower that hubris and the assumption set down. We think, okay, so if I live in Portland, say I should have decent broadband, right? But we don't. And that decent broadband is even poorer in immigrant communities and communities of color and lower income communities. Let me say, well, they should have it, but they don't. And there, and there are many systemic reasons that they don't, one of them being an assumption, right? That they should, but why do we assume that, right? Or the, why do we assume that they have access to a computer? Why do we assume that they, even if they did have a computer, that they would not use it, right? So these are systemic issues you have to sort of go down the wishbone of questioning and, and answer. So for us, for us, it is one, one answer to the question of, can we close the economic divide, right? So Maine has, has shot itself in the foot many a time by saying, well, there is the rural area and then there's the urban area. Well, there's only 1.3 million people in Maine and they're all in the same playing field. And so having an infrastructure that says, everybody has access, Everybody has equitable access. Everybody's got affordable access. Now you change the conversation. You change the dynamic, right? So it's a question now, what do we do with it now that we have that all together? So it's not a question of winners and losers. And in order to do that, the infrastructure has to be future-proof, which is why we believe it should be fiber, right? It should live here for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? There's a reason why the rural electrification program was a success. It went everywhere. It just didn't go to New York, or Chicago, or Los Angeles, right? It went to the hinterlands of rural America. So here's the data set, right? Out of 330 million Americans, 160 million do not have access to broadband. Now you may define and argue about what constitutes broadband, but they don't. And a lot, and those 160 million Americans are outside of what we call tier one city metro areas. So it's outside the Boston's, the Chicago's, the Miami's, the New York's, and the Los Angeles. That's a ton of people, ton of people that are not part and parcel of the day-to-day -day robustness of, you know, call it life. Because you watch the wheel of death and the only thing we think is, oh my God, how am I gonna get my homework done? I mean, we, we went through that in the pandemic. GWI was not the only one certainly of any of these ISPs that were trying to connect people up so that the kids can do homework. So that's a very, very real thing, right? So for me, for GWI, it is an ethical, moral, financial, and I would say economic obligation that we part, be part of the solution. And the solution is to equalize the infrastructure. That's, that's, that is one of the answers. So people, I know Frank have talked about it, Charlie have talked about it, Jason, Chloe have talked about it, right? You have to open up the door. The door cannot be just for a handful of people. The door cannot be just for those who have some earning power. That's not fair. So the reason why these conversations are probably amplifying the last two years is probably of two, right? It's a societal conversation. And two, there is an ecology in Maine that as a population, as a demographic, we need to become more vibrant and vital and inclusive, right? So in order for us to grow our population, in order to grow our GDP, we have to invite, invite members of society that we have traditionally sort of said, and later. Now the later is gone, is now, right? And that's the correct thing to do. It's painful. It's a lot of hard work. It will take a while. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. But I think it's necessary, right? I, I truly, truly, GW truly, truly believes that. It's an absolute necessary for main society to say it's inclusive and diverse if it's to grow. And the only way you do that is with access to infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left. I do have a question from the chat I'm going to ask. And um, Charlie, I see that you answered it uh, a little bit, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to expand. So this is from Linda Greer, an adult education director. She says, we are providing local community education that fills gaps in skills 
that support the pathways you're described that you were previously describing. We're also building our partnerships with the community colleges and the employers. What would you suggest is an important next step for us to advocate for in funding and program development? And so Charlie, if you wanna expand and then if anyone else would like to take a swing at that question, again, it's in the chat. I know that was a little bit of a long one. So um, Charlie, did you wanna expand a little bit? Absolutely, and thank you for allowing that. I realized I, I sort of did half a, a response and didn't really get to the crux of what Linda was asking. But, um, and, and that is really the challenge because we do, you know, we've got a, a, a Department of Education. We have towns that operate adult eds um, that operate under school districts. We have a community college system. We have a university system. And we all get our pockets of money. We all get whether we've got people within our midst that can um, write for grants, which we've done it's pretty uh, fairly recently successfully, or we're getting stimulus money. Um, I have to say, I don't necessarily understand all the channels that when ARPA came in and the state was deciding to say, well, where this, the money's going, where the, the adult ed sat, um, you know, you've seen streams of money going to counties, to towns, to the Department of Ed. So you're seeing all these streams. So um, I, li what Linda brought up, I have probably had that question asked of me of five or six times in the last two weeks. Um, and so the, the, the best answer I have is we are working with our local adult eds, um, as Linda suggested, as well as the State Department of Ed under Gail Sinise and her staff um, we have regular meetings, Megan Dichter and I, Gail Sinise and others in our department have regular meetings to suggest that there, I understand there is grant funding coming, they're putting it together, they're planning it, they're talking with us so that we use these resources in the most efficient and best ways. And I think one example um, we can do, or at least in, in, within my, my power that I have, is I can encourage our colleges, listen, if you're going to do don't repeat digital literacy if your local adult ed can partner. If you're putting a training program together for C plus, uh, excuse me, A plus, um, or, or a, a basic cybersecurity, and you're having people apply to that but realize they don't have the basic digital literacy, literacy skills, make sure you're reaching back out as you're planning that training program to go, assume you're gonna have people who don't meet the, the, the basic criteria to handle that next level and build that into the training, build it right from the start. So when these people come forward and there's a little bit of a window to say, listen, start this digital literacy, get this done. And when you're done, here's the next step with, um, with the CompTIA or whatever uh, industry recognized certification, which is next. So that's one of the strategies. Um, I appreciate Karim's, you know, this isn't gonna be a sprint, this is a marathon. We are building this, it's gonna take some time, but it's gonna keep all of us, um, and I appreciate Jason's uh, work. You know, he keeps us putting our pedal on the gas um, and making sure we're not, um, you know, uh, we're not giving up on putting these better systems and more efficient systems together. I've got some good examples. We need to do a lot more. I don't know if anyone else, Jason or others, would want to jump yeah. in on the adult education side. I'd love to to weigh in uh, oh. because certainly, let's just call it what it is. You know, adult education needs more state, local, federal resources for the amazing work that they do, uh, the courses that they are able to put together, and execute. And the number of people that they serve specifically is the the largest value sort of within our education system. So, uh, just just want to be clear about that. I I also think. You know that uh, I spent a lot of time in Augusta, a lot of uh, a lot of my time with with uh, legislators and different departments in, in state government, and I and I really think we need to keep working together and collaborating uh, with our policymakers at the state level regarding the connection with adult education, uh, needing both additional funding, but also adult education being a huge part in helping us develop young people and adults with uh, skills for success in the digital economy specifically. So as we think about partnerships, it's not just programming partnerships, but it's also sort of advocacy partnerships specifically. And we've seen some good success there on, on the broadband side, and we've seen some good investment in training programs in general, but I think I think we need to do more work connecting our, our local adult ed providers with 
kind of powerful educational institutions and nonprofits like mine and others, as well as employers, to really advocate for, for more dollars and, and more support. We, we can't have that all be on, or mostly be on local school districts uh, specifically. We need, we need larger investments. So I, I just wanna, really, I just wanted to say, I think the policy space in Augusta is also another avenue that we can, uh, that we need to keep pursuing and keep putting the pressure on because the investment, uh, we're can bring much larger dollars than than uh, than working just with our local uh, districts uh, and, and school budgets and, and, and voters. So I think there's an opportunity for continued collaboration, uh, especially because policymakers want to hear what communities need, and they and they are they do understand the importance of broadband. And now we need to help them understand that part two is getting our workforce ready for success in in the digital economy, specifically once we have the infrastructure in place. Absolutely. Well, hopefully there's some good conversations that are coming out of today and maybe some new collaborations. Um, so Chloe, I have a quick question for you as well. So we've talked, we've had mention of the value of libraries um, throughout this call conversation today. And I'm wondering, you know, how you have not just adapted in the last year or six months to a year, but also how you feel libraries still play a role in moving forward some of these digital conversations in communities throughout Maine and you know how you're looking towards the next year for the role that libraries play. As we know, Maine State School Library Network, libraries have access in communities where no one else has that strength of access. So it does, it is an anchor institution for connectivity and out of that conversation. So just wondering from your point of view, what what that role looks like, not just now, but moving forward. Yeah, I think, you know, our library has always been a space for the community um, to, we have, you know, the fastest internet on the island. Um, so, you know, we, not only do we have students taking advantage of that, but we've run into something that I think kind of um, became more prevalent during the pandemic, but it was, it's always been, growing is that you know we have a growing need for people that want to work remotely in our community and it's just not always possible at everyone's homes um, especially during the summer our population grows it probably triples um, with summer visitors and people that have summer homes um, and you know we saw a lot of people coming into the library every day we were open trying to get you know internet to do zoom meetings things like that and it wasn't really something we'd run into before this summer, I would say, um, at this level. Um, so, you know, it, it's something that we, we were trying to work with the community, you know, what are the best hours to be open? Um, you know, people can access the internet outside of the building, but obviously that's not always ideal for somebody that is trying to be on a Zoom meeting or doing work. Um, so that was a challenge we were really trying to navigate this past year. Um, and then another thing is that, you know, we're always just trying to get the, the island students, the high school students um, connected with what their options are for after they graduate. So we don't have a high school on the island, um, but the students commute over to Yarmouth. Um, but, you know, the, the population of students that we actually have from the island is dwindling pretty much every year. Um, a lot of them don't have the resources to figure out, you know, what their options are. Um, so that is why that's actually one way I got connected with the Allen Institute with this um, was, you know, speaking about how they can figure out their scholarship options, um, you know, their access to, to, to things, you know, um, applying to schools, trade schools, everything like that. Um, so every year we, we get involved with this with the Island Institute, but one initiative I'm working on is, you know, having um, programs through the library where they can, you know, this fall come and work, whether it's remotely or in person to try to, you know, problem solve for their future and figure out what they want to do and, um, you know, have somebody that can walk them through some of these processes. Um, Thankfully, the Island Institute has multiple people that help them with that, um, like Krista, which we're very thankful for. Um, 
But, you know, that's a challenge that we see every year in the community on Shebeg is, you know, students just not knowing about these options and not being connected and, you know, not having the resources. So I think that's something we're always working on. Um, but, you know, we're, um, we're getting there and we're thankful for the expanding broadband and other resources that we're receiving. Thank you. And I feel like almost every broadband conversation in the state started by people at a library. They're, they're there for Tech Tuesdays. They're there because they're using the internet because they don't have it at home. And you get a few of them together and you've just got a broadband grassroots effort right there. So I think this last question is probably going to take us through to time. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you to the incredible panelists that have been on today. Um, so for Frank, Charlie, Karam, I'm just wondering if there is a student or employee's workforce pathway that you wish more people would follow. Um, I really like the idea there are, um, and there will be increasing models. I just put up a, a link to talk about an initiative that will actually get underway in January. Uh, through, we were very fortunate to receive a grant from the Ascendium Foundation, who serves a lot of rural states in the country uh, with a remote, uh, what we're calling remote worker for me. This will be a grant that will allow people starting in January, if they want to become a remote worker, there will be classes and oppor training opportunities to sort of understand what do you need in place, what's the technology, what do you have to do to do that, but as well, there will be for current um, employers in the state who are going to make more people remote, as Karen suggested, he does uh, quite uh, frequently in his organization. What are the skill sets um, that will make you more effective, as well as if you're supervising a group of remote workers, what are those skill sets and what, and what do they take? So more to come on that, uh, the specifics of that, but there would be some opportunities coming the first of the year to specifically a look at what it takes to, to work in a remote environment. I would jump in and say that we've got an opportunity to do better communication. Um, why don't we take a son of a lobsterman that's doing cybersecurity on a Patriot missile and make them available to speak to islanders and rural communities and a sort of show and tell. Uh, not people with ugly beards or senior people, but bring it down to their level and, and let them see. I think there's an opportunity to take a range of people that represents the remote areas and just our general areas, smaller towns and say, yes, you can. Because between the people on this call, we all know those people that have been able to do unbelievable things. And yes, you can earn large volume, a large amount of money if you want, but it's not only about money and, and you can stay in Maine and, and that. So certainly we need more from Karen. There's no doubt about it. Your job isn't done for a long time, sir. <laughs> but there are many things we can do, but we don't see them. And I think if we were to work with the Island Institute and similar to just say, yes, you can, and, and to give them evidence of those. I've certainly got 10 students that could do that. Not sure if they would, but I can think of them and I could request them. And Charles has got some of those. And we, we just have that as a suite of simple short messages that people can look at to communicate. And I know this is a small thing, but I think it could be powerful because the folks at our high schools have so many other things to do that career guidance isn't one that still squeezes in enough time amongst all the other responsibilities. And, and maybe this is an opportunity to do that. I'd certainly be willing to volunteer and work with others that, that want to do something and make that a resource. Well, I think we just landed a very wonderful follow-up to this. There's some, maybe some workforce profiles and we saw some very interesting five words or less in the chat. So Karen, from an employer's point of view, have you had an employee that um, his workforce pathway has has been, you know, interesting or that you wish more people would follow? Yeah, so we have a pretty good track record. The majority of our of my senior staff and the majority of our employees 
are trained by us, they're high school graduates. So think about it. Uh, so we are a company that is the forefront of the tip of technology in the 21st century. And we have people leading that charge who are hungry, forward-leaning, capable, smart, high school graduate, high school graduates. So I, I want to really amplify what Frank is saying. Yes, we can. As a main, as as main, we are traditionally introverted and and don't like to externalize ourselves. I think the time is at hand to do so. We should be fearless psychologically and emotionally and spiritually to lean in and say, yes, we can do this. And we should not be fearful of the onset of the future. We should be brave enough to admit that the past is our anchor, that the present is our guide, but the future is coming and we need to catch it and grab it and own it. And I think that to a large measure is our call. It has to be our call because that's the only way we're really going to infinitesimally change the world for the better. Truly, truly, truly. So our workforce is a manifestation of that. And we're not the only one. We're one of many that have done this in Maine where the workforce is an amplification of its core capability. Creative, hardworking, refusing to take no for an answer. Have a little bit of chip on our shoulders to say, you know what, we're going to take on the world and get it done. You know, so I think those, those things are really, really key for us. And I think we need to amplify it. We tell, need to tell the kids, don't have fear. Come on. And oh, by the way, I'll make a plug for the three jobs that are going to dominate the 21st century because that we have a need for that. Data visualization, cybersecurity, <laughs> and software programmers. We can really rule the world with that. And we have it. They're all around us. All these kids around us, they can do it bar none all of them wonderful well thank you all thank you all for joining us in the in the audience today um i wish we could be in person but this has been an incredible opportunity to meet virtually have such a diverse panel thank you karam charlie frank chloe and jason as well for your thoughtful insights i hope that you know this is not the last time we will definitely not the last time we will hear from each other um, and i hope that the panel helped spark your all's imagination, thinking about your own workforce um, development, your career pathway, both previously and into the future. And I, you know, I think if I can take one thing away from it, it's keep talking about those pathways and, and being a part of it and inspiring others around you. So again, thank you so much. And I will hand it back to, to Krista and our workforce team who will move you into the next session.